Great. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get, uh, let's get started. Um, welcome to the LSE for this evening's event. My name is Hugh Cole. I'm the Country Program Director for the International Growth Center, and I'll be chairing this event. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Duncan Green and Nyla Kabir as our speakers, although they hardly need a, a welcome, so given that they are part of the LSE. Um, Duncan is a, a senior strategic advisor at Oxfam GB and a professor in practice at the International Development Department at the LSE. Uh, in addition to the book he will present uh, this evening, he is also the author of From Poverty to Power, which is also the name of his very popular blog. Uh, Nala Kabir is a professor of gender and development at the Gender Institute and the International Development Department at LSE. Professor Kabir is a social economist and works primarily on poverty, gender, and social policy issues. So the, the format for this evening is that Duncan's uh, going to give a talk of about 30 minutes or 35 minutes. Um, Nyla is going to respond based on what Duncan has to say, but also having read the book. Um, and after which we'll um, move to a, a time of discussion and uh, questions from the floor. And we're going to try our be I'm going to try my best as chair to protect that time uh, so that you all can, can quiz Duncan and Nyla. Um, so just a few words before we get started. Um, the International Growth Center, or the IGC, is hosting this event tonight. The IGC um, aims to promote sustainable, inclusive growth in developing countries by providing demand-led policy advice based on frontier research. We're uh, a partnership between Oxford University and the LSE. We have teams in 14 countries uh, with an international network of economists and policy partners that we work with. So why would the IGC be interested in the question of how change happens? Um, and indeed, I have just been answered, asked that question. Um, uh, in the foreword to the book, the economist Ha Jun Chang says that Duncan has succeeded in writing a book that can provide sophisticated theories of change while providing practical advice to activists. Uh, Importantly for me and for the IGC, Ha Jun Chang points out that the insights from the book are applicable uh, to activists in the broadest sense. So uh, NGO campaigners and grassroots uh, organizers on one end, politicians and civil servants, and business people maybe on the other, and even academics. Um, but the IGC works on the interface between uh, evidence and policy, and uh, like many organizations in the space, our model has some assumptions about how evidence can change policy and then how policy can end up uh, in turn changing real world outcomes. Uh, but every day our country teams, the academics we work with and our policy partners uh, engage in the, uh, the complexity, the power and the institutions that Duncan will discuss tonight. Uh, sometimes it's tempting to think that uh, if the evidence is robust enough and your uh, ideas are compelling enough, then uh, that will be uh, enough uh, for the policy champions we work with to be able to drive the positive change they seek, or at least prevent the, th the, the negative change they want to try and prevent. But uh, we, we know that that you know, is, is too simplistic. And reminding, uh, reading the book reminded me again of how important it is to think systematically and very deliberately, not just about what is going to change, but also about how that change is gonna happen. So with those uh, few words, I just want to cover a couple of practical points, um, and then we'll get into it. So for those using um, Twitter uh, in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is Alice Change. Uh, if I could ask you to put your phones on silent, please, to avoid disruption, that would be appreciated. Uh, this evening event is being recorded, uh, and barring any technical difficulties, it will be available online. And there will be a book signing taking place uh, following the event, and importantly, copies of How Change Happens uh, will be on sale outside the theater. Um, now, if you could please join me in welcoming Duncan and Nyla. Okay, can people hear me? Is this working? Yep, good. Um, we had a discussion about how we were gonna do this, and I said I'd like to wander around and Nyla said, okay, you can be Donald Trump's Mike Hillary, <laughs> which was, uh, nearly made me change my mind and sit down while talking, actually, but uh, I'll, 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 I have to pace, so I'm going to pace. Um, I need to get the, uh, 
the right PowerPoint up first, though. Okay, here we go. Um, great. Let's see if it's working. Yes, it's working. Okay. So I have a fantastic job at Oxfam, and one of my roles at Oxfam is to try and stop clever graduates from the LSE coming to take my job. And I spend quite a lot of time making sure that that happens. Because what I get to do is to move between academia and practice. So I read uh, the the, you know, all the papers and the books. I try and translate them on the blog into something more intelligible for a wider group of people. And then I travel around and, and compare what I've re read and talked about here with what I see on the ground. And it's, a, it's an enormous privilege. And every now and then, one of those trips becomes a kind of intensive seminar with light bulbs going off every few seconds, um, oh, certainly, yeah, uh, every few hours, uh, and becomes a very intensive course. And about 10 years ago, I did uh, a trip to the Bundelkant in India, which is in a, 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 an arid region, an overnight train ride away from Delhi, to talk to some fishing communities there. And it was one of those fantastic moments. And I've been really processing that one visit for the last 10 years. Um, so I think I'll start here. Um, because a lot of the, the things they told me started to fit into a pattern which became basically a, a lot of the content of the structure of the book emerged from this conversation. So these people are, first of all, they're lower caste. They're right at the bottom. They're sort of in the sort of Dalit untouchable categories within India, which is a profound state of identity and being. Um, they've historically been fishing communities. They fish ponds, as they call them. Uh, actually, they're quite large man-made lakes in this region. And they fished them for centuries. But about 20 years ago, something terrible happened, which is people realized that if they introduced eggs and fish fry into the ponds, the ponds became far more productive. Should be good news, but at that point, upper caste people suddenly smelled money. They came in, and these people were driven off the ponds. So the first lesson, technology shocks, prices, um, uh, have massive social and political consequences very quickly. Their lower caste, most of them would just, yeah, this is what they're accustomed to. Twelve young men actually stood up and protested, um, and they were beaten up by um, the uh, thugs hired by the, uh, the new landlords um, of, of, the, of those ponds. Um, so another question, why those 12? What makes people pick up leadership even when they're in these kind of very inferior positions where they've internalized that inferiority? When they were beaten up, the rest of the communities rallied round. They were angry that their, 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 their boys were being, being abused. And that triggered a process of social mobilization. So another interesting and recurring feature that acts of repression often trigger acts of social, uh, processes of social change. Next, what happened was that the, the, the fishing communities got organized and they found an ally, a really important ally, who was a Brahmin, an ex-civil servant, um, who, had, when he finished being a civil servant, as people sometimes do in India, he set up as an NGI, a non-governmental individual. Okay, um, with a little briefcase, you know, with his projects and, um, and you know, busily sort of developing his, his business. Um, and he allied with these people. And because he was a Brahmin, he could open doors. Okay, he got them a meeting with the police chief. The police chief took up their case. And the fishing communities were astonished. They'd never even talked to the police chief before this. He brokered a conversation with politicians. There was a fishing minister in Madhya Pradesh, where, the, where Bundelkant is, um, who was an ex-fisherman himself and understood what was going on, and he led a process of changing the law to uh, grant pond rights to cooperatives. If these people set up cooperatives, they could get pond rights. So another interesting question, change doesn't tend to just happen with masses mobilizing, they need to find allies in positions of power. Um, when I went there in 2006, the process had done really well. They'd, they'd got to, they, I think they'd taken back about 100, 150 ponds. Um, they were producing well. There were threats of climate change uh, starting to, you know, drought was becoming a serious problem. But uh, overall, it was a really good story. I talked about it in From Poverty to Power, and then I left. And in the aid and development business, when you get a really good story, the best thing is never go back. Because when you go back, you're going to find that someone's run off with the money, or that it was never a good story to begin with, you just didn't understand properly, or whatever. Um, or you, you, know, you missed something. But this year, it was such a big deal for me that this year I actually said, look, I've got to go back. I mean, it would probably be a disaster. And so I went back, 
we met the same Brahmin and we went out with this Brahmin guy to the fishing communities and a huge relief, it's just got better. Okay. So um, there are now 250 ponds, this is 2016, under control. Um, the Brahmin is surplus to requirements. Okay. So he has been completely co-opted by the Indian government. A couple of years ago the Indian government passed a rule saying, um, a law saying that corporations have to spend 2% of their profits on social responsibility. And this has led to an epidemic of toilet building. <laughs> so corporates love toilets because you can stick your plaque on them and they're tangible and they're not political. And so all over India, toilets have been built at a phenomenal rate. They can be used for chickens, some of them even use as toilets. Um, uh, and the, the non-governmental individual now has a staff of 80 and is just producing toilets like there's no tomorrow. Um, and the, the fishermen said, it's fine, it's fine. We, we now are so well organised, we talk to politicians directly. You know, we don't need an intermediary anymore. So there's a kind of graduation going on there. The other thing which was absolutely striking was I was having a big uh, meeting, a conversation with about you know, 30 or 40 men and women, um, which is one of the sort of more enjoyable um, things you do when you're on these trips. <coughs> for the first time in about 30 years of working in this kind of field, I actually at one point said, could the women shut up and let the men talk, please? Um, <laughs> which was a phenomenal change in consciousness since 2006. Um, uh, and the women are yeah, extraordinarily confident and assertive are, as part of this, this process. So it was a fantastic visit. Um, I thought I'd start there and I'll now get on to the much more boring bit of, sort of systematising that a little bit and explaining what's in the book. It's not a new topic, Heraclitus, 6th century BC. Um, it's nice to quote Marx at the LSE. Uh, but I have a problem with this quote, which is, you know, it's a very famous quote from Marx, that the philosophers were not interpreted the world, the point is to change it. A lot of the people who this book is aimed at have gone way, way the other, the other, to the other extreme. Activists have a tendency to just want to change it, and they need to interpret the world as well. So the central message from the book is to be a good activist, you have to also be a reflectivist. You have to reflect on what's going on, reflect on the system, reflect on your own role, and it's not good enough just to be a frenetic uh, uh, campaign, and you've got to think and study and uh, reflect as well. The target audience is wider than campaigners, and there is no word for them, so I've used a piece of dreadful development jargon. Um, it's because what I've found, and over the years I've worked with you know, pension funds, uh, supermarkets, government, um, NGOs, and actually what I've found is that a lot of the uh, challenges of being a reformer in any of those institutions are remarkably similar. So the book is aimed at those people who are trying to create reform and change within their institutions or using their institutions to create it more widely. So I think there is a, there is a generic discussion on the dynamics and nature of change which is worth having. The contents, and I'll just run through this quickly and then go on to some slightly more interesting stuff. Um, the bit I'm going to talk about tonight is the first section on systems thinking and power, because I think a lot of the book flows from that and it's one of the more sort of, I think, important messages from the book. The book then sort of romps through the, 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 kind of the, the institutions that typically are involved in change processes, both in formal and informal, but you know, formal institutions like states, uh, judiciaries, uh, parliaments, and international system and, and transnationals, um, and talks about activism, leadership, um, and advocacy, which is this kind of emerging profession which I'm a bit dubious about, of changing policy through uh, particular forms of, uh, of influencing. And then the bit which is normally missing from the, the books on development is the so what. And, uh, typically you'll have a really good diagnosis and then a vague call to action. We must all do something about climate change. Political will is necessary. Um, yeah, meaningless, vacuous statements because it's actually really hard to work out what to do. So I spent probably a dis yeah, the majority of the time while writing the book pushing people to tell me what this means in practice. What are the actual lessons for this? And what, what can you say to activists and what can you not say to activists? Yeah, so uh, I'll talk about, so I'm going to talk about the first bit and the last bit and you'll just have to take on trust that there's loads of really intelligent, clever, well-read stuff in the middle, okay? Um, if only vivers were that easy. Um, the cake. All right. So to make a cake, you need ingredients. You need a recipe. Well, I need a recipe anyway. Uh, you need an oven. And if you've got the ingredients and you follow the recipe and the oven works, whoever you are, 
wherever you are, whenever you are in history, you will produce something which is cake-like. This is an essentially linear process where if you follow the instructions, you roughly know what you're going to achieve, and if you've got a cake, you know it's because you cooked it. Okay? This is the project. The project is the kind of, it's become so much, it's so ingrained in activism and in aid and development that it's almost impossible to imagine a world without projects. You know, imagine that projects were banned. How would aid and development function? Um, and projects came from a particular place. They're very much based on uh, infrastructure, road building, bridge building, and so on. S sort of early, early after the Second World War, this is where the project grew up. And now, if you want to work on sexuality, child rights, uh, governance and accountability, everything has to be framed as a project, which is, with some bells and whistles, essentially linear in nature. You write down in your project document, I'm going to do this in order to achieve this, and I'm going to have monitoring evaluation so that when I achieve something, I will be able to attribute that thing to my actions and then come back and ask for some more money. Okay, that's how aid works. That's the, the uh, treadmill we're, we're on. The trouble is that the places where you're doing this tend to look like this. This is a US military PowerPoint from Afghanistan. Okay? Um, and when it came out, there was a great deal of laughter. It whizzed around on, on the internet. But actually, it's, it's a really good faith effort to do a stakeholder mapping of who talks to who and who influences who uh, within Afghanistan. The consultant who drew it up showed it to General Petraeus and was immediately sacked, okay? um, because it was not simple. It wasn't a project. It was a complex system. And the point about complex systems is that there are so many connections and feedback loops that if you intervene in that system, if you poke it with a hundred million dollars of aid or 10,000 US Marines, effects ripple through that system in an essentially unknowable way. You cannot predict, however smart you are, what the results of that prod will be. And if something changes, and these systems change all the time, if this system changes, you cannot be 100% sure why. So you can't attribute it, the change, to a given cause which is kind of obvious, that's how life is. But we approach life with cakes. We approach life with projects. So is there some better way where we can actually adapt what we do beyond cake making to fit with the reality of systems? And that's essentially what the book's about. The nature of change in these systems is different to the nature of change in the, in the sort of mental world of the project. It's much less continuous. Projects, you know, I look at Oxfam projects, we're going to do this in the first year, this in the second year, this in the third year, you know, and they're essentially pretty continuous. Change in systems is much spikier. You get these big critical junctures, moments of change, shocks, opportunities, collapses, changes of, of leadership, um, wars, conflicts, and these are huge, play a huge part in driving change at the big scale, so in Britain, World War I, women's, uh, women's suffrage, World War II, National Health Service. War is a huge driver of change, so the Great Depression, huge driver of change within, you know, in terms of financial regulation. But also at the small scale, those 12 guys who got beaten up in Tikhan Gah, that was a critical juncture for that community and, and transformed it. Power relations were thrown up in the air by that moment, and when they came down, they came down in a different place, and people saw different possibilities, and they wanted to do different things. Path dependence. So in a situation like that Afghan map, one thing leads to another and everywhere is the product of its own history. Everywhere is different, everywhere is context you know, specific. Academics say that till, yeah, endlessly. What it, and and it's, again, it's a truism, but we go into those contexts with our toolkits and our best practice guidelines and our frameworks. So are they actually irrelevant? Are they useless? Or do we just need to adapt them really well to make them relevant to the path dependence of any given place? I boil it down for my colleagues at Oxfam to say, how do you plan when you don't know what's going to happen? And how do you campaign when you don't know what the answer is to the problem? And these are big challenges to the typical model of, of activism. Mike Tyson got it all very, very sort of succinctly expressed. <laughs> Anybody who's run a campaign will know this feeling. Um, you just got all your materials ready, and something happens, and you have to move the launch, or the, it turns out that you, know, you were wrong, or you know, that kind of thing. It happens all the time. We get punched in the mouth. And it's not just a shame or a problem. It's the nature of complex systems. 
all the cultural references in the book come from when my kids were teenagers. Um, so they're sort of early 2000s. So you, you've got Harry Potter, The Matrix, The Wire, and then it just stopped because I kind of stopped watching anything after that. So uh, I, I think, I, I don't know what I've missed, but not much, I suspect. But, but The Matrix is, um, the first Matrix film is really good. Don't watch the others if you can avoid it. Um, and there's a moment in The Matrix film where Neo, the, the, the Christ-like figure, sees the matrix, the ones and zeros that are behind reality, and he becomes, once he can see the matrix, he becomes invincible. Um, and at sort of moments of extreme delusion, I feel like that about power, right? That if once you start looking at power in a room, once you start thinking, so who's sitting in the front row? Who's sitting in the back row? Who's talking to who? In any situation, you stop thinking about anything else. You just want to know. You want to make the power visible in any, in, in any context. And I've sort of come to see power as like a force field in communities and in, in relationships, and, if, and, and redistributing power towards a more equitable distribution um, is probably the underlying thing that a lot of people in aid and development and activism are trying to do. Some of them are trying to actually make it less equal, but you know, and they often use the same techniques, which just makes it very confusing. But um, trying to get power visible so that we can talk about it is a very very important task, I think, uh, if you're going to work in a systemic way. There are various ways of thinking about power, lots and lots of different frameworks. The one paragraph of Foucault I actually understood, so I always put it up when I'm speaking in universities to sort of establish my credentials. Um, the bit about the gaze, you know, if you're in an inferior, in a subordinate position, you are acutely conscious of the gaze to such an extent that you interiorize it. You spend your whole time worrying about you know, how you look, who you are, how you're, you know, whether you're behaving properly. Um, and that has become such an internal part of people's lives that overcoming that gaze is one of the first steps of empowerment in many situations. These women in Guatemala did it. Okay? They went from, this is what they were talking about their childhood, they gave us words, stupid, you can't, you don't know, poor thing, you're a woman, and they ended up setting up an in, uh, a really effective uh, women's movement, which was extraordinarily brave and taking on the, the Guatemalan security forces with their kids uh, in, in really quite an extraordinary way. Now, the way that process happens, I find very useful some work by a woman called Jo Rowlands, uh, who wrote a book on empowerment in, women's empowerment in Honduras. And Jo says that um, it often happens with a light bulb moment uh, in people's heads, a moment when uh, a switch is flicked and people who have had that internalized uh, sense of inferiority or uh, uh, rightlessness um, start to say, these are my rights, I want to demand things, um, you know, he has no right to beat me, they have no right to demand bribes, whatever it is, that process of the light, light bulb going on. And different things work for different people. For years, I just kind of airbrushed out people saying to me, it was that workshop that, that, that made me realize what, what was going on, because I couldn't believe that anyone could actually get something useful out of a workshop. Um, uh, I met an indigenous activist in Bolivia once who said, you know, the thing that changed my life was ILO Convention 169. <laughs> Anderson. Um, and he said, you know, when I read that, the indigenous part of me woke up. And I know the guy who wrote that at convention, so I wrote to him and said, yeah, it really worked for this one person, you know. They actually read it and it changed their life. Um, so Joe's point is that when you get these light bulb moments, uh, people then look around and see people in similar situations and they just start to organize uh, and you get power with. And then it all kicks off and, it, and it's very unpredictable what happens next. So in Nepal, um, and I love it when it's unpredictable and we can't control it. So in Nepal, we had uh, uh, a very worthy Oxfam project of um, women's discussion groups where they're fairly isolated in their homes, so they, 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 they would come to these safe areas where they could discuss whatever they wanted, and we would get in speakers, you know, our partners would get in speakers, and you know, the idea was um, consciousness raising, all very, very sort of polite. Within a couple of months, they had identified the main problem in their village as the alcohol stalls uh, that was selling booze to their men, and their men were then beating them up, and they were planning to burn them down. Okay? <laughs> um, fine. You know, tricky one for the partners, but we say, well, we're right behind you, off you go, you know, and help them. Um, so once, it, once, you, once the power with starts, you get things like Tikam Gai, you get things like the women in Nepal, it all gets very interesting. And then, then you achieve power too, 
influence government, influence the allocation of resources, change laws, change policies, change practices, and power over. I, don't, I do not accept the, that sort of power corrupts, all power corrupts and, power, and yeah, absolute power corrupts, absolutely, it's just nonsense. If you start with that, that approach, you're never gonna win. So you've, you've got to see that power over can be useful too. Um, I think Morales has done great things for Bolivia. I actually think, despite the current situation, the Workers' Party has done great things for Brazil. Power over is also desirable in many situations. We use power analysis um, in, in quite a sort of pragmatic, instrumental way. We use it to design big global campaigns on the arms trade treaty or on the, you know, uh, um, uh, modern slavery or whatever, but actually we use it really locally. And this was a, a, an example from Tajikistan, a really depressing post-Soviet country um, where uh, the state's withdrawn and not much has taken its place. Uh, most of the men go and work in Russia. Um, and we were doing some work on water and sanitation, trying to get villages to take responsibility for uh, their water and sanitation because the quality was really poor. Um, so we went out and spent a couple of days with the, uh, in the villages, and then we came back to uh, the Oxfam office where, of course, we got out the flip charts. NGOs cannot think without flip charts. Um, and so the first question was, so let's do a, a power analysis, stakeholder mapping. Who, have we, who, who makes decisions in the villages? And they did what activists always do. They said, well, there's the state and there's the people. Job done. Um, and I um, said, so, yeah, great, good start. Now, anybody else? You know, any, any sort of nuance on that? And people said, oh, well, uh, yeah, you know, the, the, the teacher's really important because they have the respect of uh, uh, the community. People go to them to, you know, how to fill in forms, how to deal with the authorities, the nurse uh, or, or the doctor. Um, the imam is really important. When people have bad dreams, they go to the imam to have them interpreted. And if you want to get to the mayor, the mayor's lover is a really useful channel because the mayor's lover, you know, absolutely tells the mayor what to do, and that's a really useful contact. And suddenly they populated this um, village uh, with an ecosystem. It was an ecosystem of power. And then we say, great, so let's put them on this two by two. If they, if they want to do something about water and sanitation, they're up this end. If they're very powerful, they're on, that, they're on this axis, okay? If you've got people here who really want to do something about water and sanitation, but they don't have much influence, well, then you can do something about that. You get them organized together, you put them in contact with people in power, you do that thing that, that was happening in Tikhamgar in terms of meeting the, the, um, the Brahmin guy or meeting the minister, and you try and get them up there. If they're influential, but they don't care about water and sanitation, that's where it gets interesting. So if you work at the IGC, who's organizing this, you'll say, we need another paper, we need more evidence. And that does work sometimes, but often it's not evidence, it's who you, who you hear the, the message from, it's the messenger. Yeah, who do we need to talk to the people, these influentials to convince them to do something on water and sanitation? What do we have to take them and show them to get them on, on side? And the idea is just to get everybody up to the top right-hand corner, because then you get things moving. So it's just a kind of, it's pretty crude, but it's remarkably useful as a way of just thinking through the power issues you're involved with. So again, just to um, take the mickey out of the IGC, this is what, um, this is what Hugh was talking about, my favorite cartoon. Big equation, big equation, and then a miracle occurs in the middle, and I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Um, and the book is basically saying, well, okay, yeah, how do we explain the miracles? What, you know, what, what needs to happen to make this the equation on the left lead to the equation on the right? I showed the book to, I have two guinea pigs called sons, um, and one of them graduated here uh, a couple of years ago, and he's now fine. Um, uh, and um, one of them is a, a community organizer for, with an organization called Citizens UK. Um, so they're both, they were both fierce critics uh, uh, of the book, as, as you would be. Um, and Callum, the, the community organizer, said, well, this is all great, but you know, no one's going to remember it when they're in a meeting or a campaign or they're doing something, unless you can boil it down to two slides. And I said, but the whole point of the book is you can't reduce this to blueprints and you know, uh, box ticking. It's everywhere. It's definitely said, fine, but then no one will read it or use it. So I listened, and uh, I went as far as I could. And I'm going to finish with this, which is a kind of um, an attempt to go as far as I can without actually completely undermining the argument of the book in terms of summary. And the way, the, the way I did it was, I, what kind of people do you have to be um, to do this stuff. Um, 
And I'm increasingly thinking that that's the biggest challenge. And then the kinds of questions you ask and keep on asking. So the reason why I think the first one is so important is because the more I talk to people about this, the more I realize that there are a whole series of cognitive dissonances which you have to manage if you're going to be an activist. So you have to be confident and assertive, and you have to be aware that you're probably wrong. Right? You have to be an insider and an outsider. You know, you, there's all these things where basically you have to be on both sides of different fences, and it's extremely painful. It's much easier just to shout at people and say you're all you know, horrible and, and to, to just take a very extreme position, but that's much less effective. So the kinds of people we need to be, we need to be curious. And this is a curiosity where you really want, if you're in a system like that Afghan, Afghan map, it's constantly changing. And it's no good doing a degree and then thinking, great, I've got that nailed. I can now just do things. Um, you've got to con consciously and constantly be interested in what's changing. Um, in the NGO world, it's the conversations that take place in the bar after you've spent the whole day planning that are really the important bits, where you find out what's changing. So I was in Myanmar a couple of months ago, and we were, having, uh, and we were looking at governance and politics in Myanmar, and, and we were having the standard conversation. You're talking about the military, you're talking about Aung San Suu Kyi's party, you're talking about civil society organisations, and then just on the margins of a conversation, someone said, have you heard about the free funeral movement? It's really interesting that you know, hundreds of thousands of people demanding the right to a free burial because burial is so expensive in Myanmar. And it's really easy in that situation to just kind of say, yeah, right, now back to Aung San Suu Kyi. Or you can say, whoa, that's interesting. Let's spend a few minutes finding out more about the free funeral movement because that might be the new thing that actually triggers change. And you've got to have that sort of lateral vision. So that curiosity is essential, I think. Um, there's a great book on systems by a woman called Danella Meadows, called Thinking in Systems, and she says you have to learn to dance with the system. Humility. So this is not being a good person. This is evidence-based humility. If you're in that Afghan situation, you really don't know what's going to happen. Um, and you need to, and as I said, the dissonance is you have to be confident and humble at the same time. And by humble, I do not mean humble bragging. Now, this is this kind of thing that's come up in the last few months. I've I noticed it a lot. Um, if you don't know what humble bragging is and you're on Twitter, follow Yanis Varoufakis, um, who tweets things like, humbled by 500 people coming to hear me tonight. Um, <laughs> that's humble bragging. Okay? Um, this is real humility. This is actually you know, um, genuinely not knowing. Uh, it's, it's sort of Robert Chambers is one of my heroes. It's that ability to be to be like Robert, to actually be open to new ideas and to accept that however many books you've written, however many people you've talked to, you really don't know what's going on most of the time. Reflexivity. So activists, are, although they're very sort of strong and confident and they march in and thump tables, they're also strangely unconfident in that they think they're sort of invisible, that they're not players, that they're not actually changing the system by, by who they are. And yet, it's quite clear that, where, that activists come with a baggage, with a background, and they have an influence on the people they talk to. In, um, there was some research in West Africa, uh, which I think Chris Blackman wrote about, um, where they had black researchers interviewing community, uh, community members in uh, West Africa and asked doing a survey, and then they did the same questions uh, with white researchers sitting quietly in the corner, not saying anything, and they got different results from the surveys. You know, just, the, the, the influence of the, even silent members on that system was, was profound. And we need to be conscious of our own prejudices, conscious of what we are hearing and what we're airbrushing out, um, that kind of question. And talking of airbrushing out, multiple perspectives. So uh, activists are great creators of monoculture. They, work, they find people just like them all over the world. Okay? People who say, use exactly the same terminology. Um, I'm sure LSE is largely responsible for this. Um, uh, and, and, they, and they sort of huddle together and agree with each other fiercely. Um, and that's not very useful. You actually need to, you know, some of the most interesting change processes I've seen come from when you're working with people you don't like, you don't quite understand. They have a completely different worldview. So I think when you get an NGO, a secular NGO working with faith leaders, working with private sector, working with government, the chances of something interesting happening are much greater than when it's 100 NGOs in a room. Five, okay. And the questions we ask, um, 
If you can be that, those, that sort of person, activists tend to be fixated on uh, policies and spending and laws. That's, that's tangible, it's short term, it's the things you can change within the lifetime of a campaign. To a much lesser extent, they look at practice, implementation. Is any of this stuff actually making a difference on the ground? But I increasingly think the thing we need to look at is norms. Our sense of what is natural, what is normal, what is, what is right. Because when you look at a sort of longer time scale, one of the striking features of what's been going on in the last 20, 30 years is how fast and accelerating norm shifts have been. Look at what's happened on equal marriage, on disability, on uh, indigenous rights, on violence against women, uh, on FGM. Extraordinary speed of change, and it seems to be accelerating faster and faster. And I think activism has a big part to play in that. Very under-researched in terms of why do these norm shifts happen? What, and can they be consciously sought, or is it just accident? Um, so I think there's a big area there which needs much more. Precedence. Two areas of precedence I think we've, we're missing. One is history. I mean, it may seem odd. There's a lot, of, a lot written on history, but I'll give you one example, which I'm currently trying to convince the LSE's Inequalities Institute to pick up. We all bang on about inequality. Oxfam loves doing its big inequality numbers. You know, 62 people have the same wealth as 3.5 billion poorest people, all that kind of stuff. When we looked at the numbers, we very quickly found 23 countries which had actually redistributed, which had reduced inequality over a 10-year period. No one has done a comparative study of those 23 countries, of why they did it, and why they stopped doing it, and what happened. People are not drawing lessons or sort of ideas from history anywhere near enough on a lot of this stuff. The other, the other set of precedents which we don't use is captured by a, a thing called the positive deviance approach, which is not as interesting as it sounds, but it's still really interesting. It's, it's, um, it's saying that on any, on, on any issue, you always have a distribution on child, child nutrition, violence against women, whatever it is, there will be a distribution. And surely the first thing to do before you try and change the system is go and look at the positive outliers and find out where things are already doing well in the system as it stands. And there's been extraordinary results from doing that on child mal malnutrition, on FGM in Egypt, on superbugs in American hospitals, but it doesn't lend itself to, projecting, to, to projectization. <laughs> It doesn't cost much money. You're just looking at where, where things are working and learning from it. But it's a brilliant approach, and I wish we could do more on that. Um, power I've talked about, and then the final point, how will we know if change is happening? In, those, in that Afghan system, imagine you're trying to drive or ride a bicycle from one side of London to another, and you decide to do it like an aid worker. Right? So you design a log frame, which is going to plan your trip. And, that, and in that log frame, you say, I will go at this speed and this direction, I'll then change direction, go up that road. You would die before you got out of you know, your own, own street. The essence of riding a bike in London, of all places, is fast feedback and course correction very quickly. Um, activism is like that. You need to constantly think on your toes. And yet we design these log frames and we design these plans without taking that into account. So how are you going to do that fast feedback? Stepping back in my remaining two minutes or so, um, yeah, that all got a bit techy and log frames and all that stuff. But there is a bigger point here, which is organizations like Oxfam reasonably enough concentrate on what remains to be done. So, you, so we basically moan a lot. We complain, we whinge, we say, this is terrible, this is terrible, that's an outrage, that's awful. And, the, and each of those things is true. The trouble is the cumulative effect is that people think the world's getting worse and actually stand back and look at the numbers, and the world is getting hugely better. We're at the end, we're, yeah, we're in an age of development the like of which the world has never seen in terms of uh, poverty reduction and eradication uh, of extreme poverty, in terms of rights, voice, literacy, mortality, you know, amazing stories. So I guess the, the, the overarching message of the book is that Change is happening uh, in a positive way in many places that most of that change is not down to activists. Most of that change is, is happening because of demographics, technology, or just stuff happening. But the activists have a fantastic role that they can play to shift that thing along, to accelerate it, or to stop bad stuff taking things backwards. And that the, in order to do that, they have to think differently and, and live differently. And if we do that, I think we can do it even better than we've done up to now. Thanks very much.
don't think that is going to move around quite as much as you do. Nope. I shall stay very still. Um, yeah, please, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, uh, it's interesting that Duncan ended where he did because it uh, segues quite nicely into what I want to start with. And that is, I'm very pleased that Duncan asked me to be a part of this event. But having read the book, I think it was probably a very good choice on his part. Uh, because we share something in common, which is an optimism, a faith that things can change for the better, a faith that may be flickering dangerously, given sometimes the way the world goes, but it remains alive. And one of the most powerful drivers for change is hope. We have to be realistic, of course, but without some hope that we can make a difference, there's no point in even trying. I'm not going to use the quote from Gramsci on the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will, but I did come across another nice quote when I was trying to work, and that is um, Gramsci on the challenge of modernity is to live without illusions without becoming disillusioned. And I think quite a lot of the message of uh, Duncan's book is about that. Now, the book is called How Change Happens, but my reading of it suggests it should have, be, it should have been called Making Change Happen. Because it's less about observing change as a vast impersonal processes that determine how society will shape in the near and distant future, and much more about how people in different places and institutions attempt to intervene in these processes and influence the direction of change. It's, about, it's, all, it's a book about how activists can make change happen. And I like a quote from it, and I'll do a couple of quotes. By being quite small cogs in a very large machine that is driven largely by uncontrollable and unexpected factors, we are still able to make a difference. Now, the theoretical apparatus that Duncan brings is very uh, expressive or useful to his uh, project of looking at change. And that is, he puts forward the power and systems analysis, which he's just described, to replace black box narratives about states, multilateral corporations, international governance systems, and so on. What he suggests instead is that we analyze power in terms of institutionalized systems, systems that are composed of different and closely interrelated elements, of which some are more susceptible to change than others. But their interconnections mean that they can have knock-on effects on some of the more intransigent elements of change. In other words, you unpack a system and you work out where, where you are likely to have greatest influence. One nice example of this was the story of homeless people in Delhi, I think, uh, who you know, can get cold. And so activists tried to get, I, I think I'm getting it right, the municipality or the Delhi municipality to get them shelter, which of course the municipality was fairly intransigent. So they took it, took it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court passed a law which requires the, the government to provide shelter for the homeless. So it's about working in the different elements of the system and working out where it's going to work. Now, I'm, I want the theory of change, and he, he, he expresses his reservations about the idea of a theory of change, but he uses it nevertheless. <laughs> so there are some elements in it which remain with me and which I'd like to talk about. One is the stress on individual empowerment. The birth of critical consciousness, of, which allows those who have become recon reconciled to their place in an unjust world to kind of wake up and smell the coffee, to work out that they have rights and they are entitled to a better place in the world. And to me, this is something that has preoccupied me in my research. I am absolutely mesmerized by understanding how someone who has been born and brought up to think of themselves as lesser human being than everyone else around them begins to assert their own humanity, begins to realize that they're worthy of respect. He called it the light bulb moment. It, it often is a, a process light bulb, right? It doesn't just light up in a minute. But through these meetings, workshops, books, whatever, things happen in people's heads. And that is what gives birth to the activist. And this process is often ignored in Western social uh, movement theories because it is so often taken for granted that activists, like rational economic man, is born and not made. But particularly activists who come from these very marginalized groups have to be made over time. 
What he also does is the unpacking of institutions. So he looks at the state and he, he talks about um, understanding it as, as institutions rather than a monolith so that one arm of the state can undo the harm that another arm of the state may have inflicted. And interestingly on this, I found this quite interesting, is that he talks about within DFID, uh, which from the outside you know, looks like a, an arm of the British bureaucracy, a very highfalutin arm, but within DFID, those who want change actually adopt many of the same strategies that activists outside adopt. So those who want change within DFID will be looking for champions, will be looking for alliances, will be looking for critical moments, and so on. He makes the point that the law itself, and in all of these, he's taking um, areas which have been seen as emblematic of power, so the state, the law. And he talks about the way that the law can be a force for the good as well as a force for the bad. It's a force for the bad when poor people have to act in isolation. It becomes a force for the good when you can act in solidarity and push uh, judges and so on to do their jobs. International agreements may not have the hard power to enforce, but they have had a very important role through these endless conferences in filtering down a consciousness of power to the grassroots level. And of course, at the grassroots level, you see attempts by activists to combine, to vernacularize these universal conventions, to combine formal and customary law in a way that is, makes sense at the local level. But of course, when I hear that in Vanatu, I think, customary law values a man at 100 cows and women at 50 cows, I don't have that much faith in customary <laughs> law. Give me the formal courts any day. He distinguishes between the long route to accountability and the short route. The long route is when you institutionalize accountability mechanisms, when you have a state that is more responsible, responsive. The short route is when you lobby your headmaster for not turning up in school, when you growl the district official who's been misbehaving. And these, to me, are also elements in building the long route. When you become aware of your power at the local level in demanding accountability, then that is a part of that process of building longer-term accountability. Similarly, he unpacks transnational corporations. <clears throat> he does this with a bit of difficulty because, uh, you know, we all have stories about, um, you know, the way in, in which corporations have plundered the world and in which some of the most exploitative forms of behavior have been practiced by transnationals. But at the same time, he points out that there are good guys and bad guys even in the corporate world. And you need to find the good guys to, in a way, act against the bad guys or act on your behalf. Two or three other things that I found very interesting. One is the distinction he makes between a strategic mindset versus a principled mindset. And I liked that because I actually put myself in the strategic mindset corner. And when I was studying uh, the Nordic road to gender equality, the Swedish road to gender equality, I was very struck by the pragmatism of feminists who worked within the bureaucracy and within the state to ensure that laws became more responsive to gender equality. And I coined my own distinction, which was between strategic pragmatism and strategic idealism, where I saw strategic idealism as having a vision and a goal to which you move and strategic pragmatism as being about trying to work with where you are and then work out what the next step is. So one, in a sense, talks about how far we have to go, and the other, in a sense, does what Duncan did, is look how far we've come, and then let's keep going. So pragmatism would require research and demonstration projects rather than campaigns and public protests. It may require working at the local level rather than the more glamorous top. It may require protecting those in power from adverse publicity, I thought this was interesting, should they seek to bring about change. Because very often politicians don't want to bring about change because of the adverse publicity that they will face. He talks a great deal about critical junctures, and uh, he mentioned that in his talk. And of course, these junctures, and I think Amartya Sen, when he was on this panel not so long ago, talked about the Second World War in Britain as ending up improving the nutritional levels of Britain. Because war imposed rationing, imposed a much more egalitarian uh, approach to diet and food. So in many cases, I think the, the cyclone in 1970 actually 
precipitated the war for liberation in Bangladesh because of the neglect of the rulers. So in many cases, these terrible crises have the effect of destabilizing what has been there before and therefore opening up opportunities to bring about change. Um, somewhere there's a tension between the tenacity you need as an activist to bring about you know, major changes and the nimble-footed you need, nimble-footedness you need to be able to spot an opportunity. But the example, one of the examples he gives actually talks about the importance of both, and it is the Tobin tax. So an economist in the 70s talked about the Tobin, the idea of taxing short-term speculative flows. It was picked up by activists in various ways over the years, but it took the financial crisis of the 2008 for it to reach the EU and to be taken up seriously by the EU. So this is 30 or 40 years later, but it never went off the agenda. So there was tenacity, there was critical opportunity, and there was language. And I think the idea of renaming the Tobin tax as the Robin Hood tax was a very brilliant way of you know, bringing home what it was going to be about. Uh, two more points. Um, Norms, I think uh, a very important point that Duncan makes is your effectiveness of norms and the ability to, mon to police your behavior relies on appearing unchangeable. They appear immutable, they appear this is the way things are. And yet norms are evolving all the time and increasingly we are seeing purposive efforts to change norms. Um, you know, the campaigns around smoking, same-sex marriage, and then we have uh, stories from India, how cable television, our research in Afghanistan showed that actually access to television was one of the few ways in which women who did not step out of their homes had access to competing discourses about women's place at home. So norms change in different ways and we are seeing those changes happening in a much more accelerated way, but of course they also change for the worse. Now, all of the things that Duncan is saying, and he himself does this, you know, you, you cannot say any of these is going to work. They all have uh, limitations, they all have um, drawbacks, they can be oversold. But of course, if they didn't, then they would be that magic bullet that we're looking for. Everything has drawbacks and everything has limitations. But each of these strategies that we're talk talking about also has possibilities. And I guess the challenge is how does one pull together these different kinds of strategies, weave them together in ways that are timely and opportunistic in order to be effective, and that requires you know, keeping your eyes on the ball all the time. I'm going to end with a quote and a fact from the book. The quote which I liked uh, is from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And the fact, did you know that the Chartists who were fighting for political rights for the working classes in Britain over a period of 10 years had a petition, gave a petition to the Parliament, to Parliament that was six miles long and had the signatures of over one third of the British population? I think that's a really interesting fact. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much to both Duncan and Nida. I, we're going to move um, to uh, questions from the floor. Um, if, when you ask a question, please give your uh, name and affiliation and wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, there are stewards here who will bring a roving mic. Um, I, while, uh, while people get settled again and, and get ready to ask their questions, I just want to ask you one question, Duncan, which is um, how you how you got to this place in your, in your thinking and in, your, and, and in choosing to invest your time in this way. Because you're a physicist by training. Mm. Um, you're contrarian by nature. I know this because I worked with Duncan at Oxfam. And I, <laughs> uh, uh, so you're skeptical. Uh, my experience is you, you just, you, you're keen to challenge authority and challenge the accepted norms. Um, so I'm interested to know how you got from physics and and uh, w I guess whatever the projected career path was for you when you graduated uh, into being, becoming an activist, uh, so it's one. And then how did you become so enthusiastic about effective states? Um, and you're even quite effective about the role of organized religion, mm -hmm. which surprises me a little. Okay. 
Um, so you, in, your, in the book, you say there's no substitute for effective and accountable states. So it's, you're quite enthusiastic about that. I wonder if you could just in a couple of minutes tell us a little bit about that journey. Okay. So as, as, as Hugh said, the original sin is studying physics. Um, and physics, in a way, f established a, a deep sense of confusion, which has stayed with me forever, um, in that if you're a physicist, you do Newton and you do wave particle duality. And, uh, and I have a nasty feeling that the book is just a massive therapeutic exercise in terms of turning my inner confusion into a sort of theory. Um, so after, after studying physics, I did fine at it. I mean, it was just... You know, it, it had borne no resemblance to anything I was ever going to do after college. But uh, I then wandered around Latin America and was brainwashed by a lapsed um, Christian brother called Tito. Tito Castro, fantastic name, um, <laughs> who took me in for a week and just fed me lots of left-wing um, uh, books to read in, on, the lakes, on the shores of Lake Titicaca with just fantastic sort of village all around me. And uh, I'm afraid that was, that was my light bulb moment. It was classic backpacker turns revolutionary stuff. Um, in terms of the state and religion, I then worked on Latin America for something like 15 years or so. And I was very social movement. Yeah, if, you, if you're working in Latin America in the, in the 80s, it was all about social movements, getting rid of the military, sticking it to the man kind of stuff. Um, and then I started reading and talking to people who'd worked on East Asia. Uh, and suddenly realized that there were these extraordinary success stories which I'd never seen in Latin America around effective states. So I became good friends with someone called Harjun Chang, who, who kindly wrote the foreword. Um, and I, wrote, uh, I read a book called Manufacturing Miracles in East Asia and Latin America, which was also a kind of absolutely, wow, look at the state. Uh, look what it can achieve. And finally, I went to work at, although I am a, always have been a devout atheist, I went to work for CAFOD, the Catholic agency and was totally impressed by the uh, commitment of uh, 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 scary nuns, above all. Um, <laughs> so we would, you know, Sister Pat never made meetings because she was always being arrested. Um, she was chaining herself to various ministries and gates and things. And just, I was just came away thoroughly impressed, I mean, by, by Sister Pat, but also more by the sort of seriousness of their, their work on social change. So now I spend my time trying to get secular NGOs to take religion seriously because all the research shows that the institutions most trusted by poor communities and poor people are faith organizations, and they are not given the space there that's required in these discussions. Great, thank you. So uh, let's take questions in groups of three. So we've got one over there. Um, anyone else? And one over here. So let's start with your question. Uh, hi, Nusha. Does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nusha Advantage from Changing Markets. Um, I would like to know maybe like, um, your thoughts, I know we could discuss this for hours, but from both of you, like, what makes individuals change agents? Because you can say marginalized communities, but some members of marginalized communities also become major obstacles to change. Like, speaking of films, Django Unchained comes to mind. Uh, but there are many, many situations where, you know, there's this internal conflict, and a lot of people from marginalized communities actually become part of the system and resist change that would be good for their community. Thanks. Great, thank you. And the second one was over here in the front. Hi, I'm Alice Fuller. I work for a UK uh, disability charity. Um, so with the professionalization of campaigning, there's lots more specialist roles, many, many specialist roles, policy, public affairs, activists, so on. Um, what advice do you have for making sure that, I suppose, with that specialisation, you also have a space for campaigners to have that overarching skill in campaigning strategy, which I think is, is what you're talking about, um, and do any organisations that you know do that particularly well? Great. Let's start with those two, Duncan. <laughs> okay. Um, great questions. Thanks. Um, so, Mitchell, I, I, I honestly don't think we know. One of the interesting things that uh, my, okay, my, uh, I'm influenced by my family a lot. So my wife is a psychotherapist. She used to work in the NGOs, and then she decided to go the whole hog and, and, and become a psychotherapist. Um, and just talking to her, I become aware of the paucity of our understanding of what motivates people. and of. Um, so we talk about power within as though this is some deep insight. But actually, it's just the most superficial possible way of thinking about what's going on inside people's heads compared to what a psychologist or a therapist or you know, all those other people. So I think there's a, a huge gap in our understanding there about why people 
become change agents because people with the same CVs behave in totally different ways. Some of the patterns I've seen, often when you look at leadership, it's people who've moved away and then come back. So it's people who go away to school, uh, indigenous leaders who go away to school or university, come back, and that, that disruption seems to have a trigger effect. Um, there's been some interesting work on women's leadership from, from ODI talking about actually <coughs> supportive families are quite important, being given the space to do this, um, but there are other issues as well around what triggers it. But it's a really understudied, and I hate to say needs more research. It's such a classic <laughs> thing, but it really does need more research. Um, I'm worried about the professionalization of campaigning. I went to a, a session with Save the Children and World Vision recently, and very unkindly, given that they invited me, then wrote a blog saying how terrible it was. Um, because um, in becoming a guild, in becoming a profession, campaigners do what professions always do when they form. So that you, have to, you need a boundary to your profession. You acquire a set of language which excludes other people. You burn the occasional heretic just to keep people you know, on their toes. And, and that's actually, it goes totally against this thing about being immersed in the system. So people then suddenly have all these tools and, you know, well, we're going to do pop mob, popular mobilization, we'll do a petition, and why? Why are you doing that? Why, why do you think that might work? You know, no, because we always do it. So there is a real risk, I think, in professionalization. On the other hand, there's clearly benefits to knowing what you're talking about and having looked at how, where this has worked elsewhere. But it, I, I, I guess one of the things should be that people who do this kind of thing should spend time doing something else. So they should... Yeah, I would love to have a much greater degree of exchange and secondment going between different actors, between big international NGOs and partner organizations and communities, between private sector and NGOs, just to keep you aware of the system before you become completely cultish. Great, thank did, you. Did Nala want to come back on that? Do you want to come back on any of those? No. Yeah. Um, any, uh, next batch of questions. So one from the gentleman over here, another one, uh, and the lady in the middle with the glasses. I'm Joe Hanlon from the LSE, from the same department as Duncan. Um, it seems to me that part of what you're saying is that we need to direct this book at our own agencies. I mean, I've got a white beard, and I'm old enough to remember that in the late 70s, when I got involved in this sort of thing, how flexible the bilateral aid agencies were, how flexible the NGOs were, and their ability to, to th deal with these complex systems. And this was before log frames and before all these other things came in, and especially results-based whatever. And there was a kind of a flexibility of saying, okay, we don't, under we don't know how it's going to turn out. And so we're prepared to do research, we're prepared to try things out. And it seems to me that that's been lost over the years with the, with the professionalization, but also with the demand that we should be able to produce clearly defined results. And we find ourselves, I think, at, at, in the grassroots level, often it's as ho we're fighting Oxfam as much as we're fighting the IMF or we're fighting the, the local elites. And that the alliance has often become the local elites with the World Bank, with the Oxfams and the so on. And the change that has taken place means maybe we need to take your book and, and look at our own institutions. Great, thank you. Um, so that gentleman there and then uh, the lady over there with the black glasses. Uh, Seamus Anderson from World Vision. Um, a very similar question. Uh, I really like what you were saying at the beginning, you know, contrasting the cake to, uh, to that complex systems map um, and saying that, you know, as organizations promoting change, we need to be much more uh, responsive uh, and adaptive in the way that we operate. Uh, so no questions, no, no argument there, definitely. Uh, but like you say, that's, that's kind of nothing new. Uh, that has been around for a long time. So I, I guess the, the, the question is, you know, at the moment, how do you see um, the aid industry? There are large, part, large parts of the aid industry that are still really promoting uh, um, the plan. They're promoting the cake. They're, they're not really uh, confident enough to allow NGOs or even um, uh, community organizations to, to be that kind of reflexive body. 
Um, so so I, I, I really like what you're saying, but I, I'd love to hear kind of your ideas of what, what's the bigger picture of, uh, you know, what are the themes happening, what are the trends happening in the aid industry broadly at the moment, and how likely is the whole industry to actually move in this more refle reflexive and, and, and adaptive way to, to managing? Great, thank you. And a uh, third question. Hi, um, first of all, thank you for coming this evening. It's been so interesting. Um, my name is Isabel. I'm a student from the Department for International Development. Um, accountability has been something that's been brought up a lot this evening. And my question to you when you're thinking about the cake and your input and your output, if we're increasingly having more partnerships that are across different sectors, public-private partnerships and development and our kind of solutions to make change happen, is that something that we need to kind of take into consideration? Are we kind of eroding our accountability as humanitarian as, as activists when we're increasingly having these different kinds of partnerships and is that going to affect our output is that affecting the nature of the cake great thank you um i will and i assure the people sitting over here i will ask the next three batch of questions from over there um duncan do you want to go first and then you can uh, do you want to go now uh, i just have one okay one why don't you start and that is about will do we see the the, the world vision right I don't see any evidence that the uh, aid community is going in the direction of greater reflexivity. I actually, I mean, I'm not as intimately, you know, uh, familiar with them as, as Duncan may be, but even in the way that they uh, fund research and the way they deal with, say, projects and organizations in the South, you know, some of the things that you talked about, the short-termism, short needing immediate results, um, you know, the push towards things that can be measured in a very short space of time, the, you know, obsession with logical framework type thinking. And that, to me, I, as, as Joe said, you know, you didn't see all that in the 70s and the 80s, and you did see the flourishing of different kinds of organizations that were very activist, that could take risks, and so on. And now, I think there's real homogeneity about the kinds of projects and organizations that are being funded. And the ones that take risks, the ones that are interested in the messy stuff, get sidelined. Okay, allow me to do the Dr. Pangloss thing. Um, <laughs> uh, I think what's... The aid industry is not a monolith. You say, I, I say everything's not a monolith. The aid industry really isn't a monolith. Um, putting it very crudely, there are two tribes on, um, on hilltops facing each other. Okay? One tribe are the results and value for money people, who are log frame, give me your KPIs, stick to the plan. But there's another tribe, and the tribe which I spend most of my time with actually are, are, have quite a lot of clout. They're talking about adaptive management, doing development differently, thinking and working politically. And these kind of coalitions are actually driven by aid donors much more than they're driven by academics or, or, or think tanks or NGOs. I don't think they're ever going to beat the value for money people. The interesting bit is when they can demonstrate that the, what they're doing works better than blindly following the plan. And then we're into some really, some of the more interesting areas of dull things like monitoring and evaluation, which is counting what counts. Oxfam's doing some really interesting work at the moment, trying to measure women's empowerment sufficiently rigorously to conv convince the bean counters on $20,000 per exercise. Because you can do an RCT, which costs a million dollars, a randomized control trial. You may then debate whether it means anything. But actually, we can't do that. We don't have that sort of money. So we're trying to find cheap, rigorous ways to count what counts. And I think we have to do that. I'm not a great nostalgist for the 70s and 80s because I think although there was lots of flexibility, there was also lots of crap. Um, so I'm hoping that out of this, rather than sort of a massive outburst of nostalgia uh, for when we sailed up the you know, um, various rivers and delivered food aid to the Cambodia and stuff, we actually get some sort of new synthesis which is a bit more systems-based and a bit more thoughtful about this stuff. And I see some very good signs of that. In terms of whether large NGOs can change, with great difficulty, I think, is a fair, is a fair answer. I was, um, Diffid came and said, NGOs, ah, so last century, justify your existence. <laughs> so I was sent off to write a paper about systems thinking and NGOs. And the, the, the sort of elevator pitch was, we need to learn how to take super tankers white water rafting, okay? The super tanker being, <laughs> Oxfam with its $1 billion spend, the white water rafting is the, the Afghan map, the kind of, my God, what's happening now? And it's a painful process, as you can imagine, trying to take the super tanker in that direction. 
Um, two other things I think we can do. One is um, we need to get much better at lobbying within the aid industry. There are some excellent examples of good donorship over 10-year timescales. There are examples of uh, donors funding catalytic things where instead of delivering, you're just bringing people together and good things are happening, multi-stakeholder initiatives. They are, I think, the, the, for Isabel's, uh, in response to Isabel, those sort of multi-stakeholder approaches are very different from a PPP, which leaves you saddled with a ridiculous debt in order to build condos for middle-class people in Lesotho or wherever. Yeah? So I think there's, there are some really interesting exercises uh, in bringing these different stakeholders together. You know, I was part of one called the Ethical Trading Initiative, which brought together trade unions, NGOs, and big garment companies to try and improve <coughs> supply chains. It's very painful. In particular, the trade unions really hated the NGOs, and there was lots of animosity. But once we'd spent enough time in the pub, it seemed to be the essential task, um, we actually built some useful uh, trust, and we did some really good stuff. So I think those kind of approaches, which are not delivering bed nets or vaccines or whatever. They're actually quite hard to measure. They're very effective and they're getting funding. So there are some good things out here, but we need to get better at highlighting the good things and allying with the leaders who get this against the sticky middle, the people I think of as the dandruff people in middle management in, in, in DFID who just want an easy life and they don't want you to mess up their plans. Those people have got to suffer and they've got to be told to do things differently by their bosses and that's what campaigners are supposed to be good at. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, let's take questions from the side. So there's a lady in the front row and a gentleman in the third row. Um, and was there anyone else? Um, just want to take a question from someone on this side. So this gentleman over here uh, behind the lectern, just so I don't forget him. So let's do three, if we can be brief, because um, we've got about 15 minutes left and they look like there are plenty more hands. So please. Uh, so Zoe Legrand from Forum for the Future. We're a sustainable development charity. Um, short question, which probably will require a long answer. Um, <laughs> so just whatever you've got would be great. Um, what do you see the role of business is in creating this change? And if you can answer that in a in developed transnational corporation and a developing country mm -hmm. business <laughs> as well. Um, um, my name is Orlando. I'm a graduate student at UCL. I study English. And what I particularly look at is how in contrast to how advertisement as an aesthetic form produces consumers, how art can imagine ways of producing political subjects. And I just wondered what you thought with respect to the discussion as it's pertained to the question of linear change versus complex systems of change. Mm -hmm. You might imagine art can influence that because I think that the novel for a long time has been a form that's tried to imagine the world in that kind of way. And I wonder if there's opportunity for cross-collaboration, cross perhaps more between humanity subjects and social sciences in that respect. Great, thank you. And the last uh, question from the dispatch is the gentleman over there. Uh, Toby, Toby Chambers, uh, social innovation researcher. Uh, to get the change, it's usually incredibly difficult. And we've got a really interesting situation where Brexit happened but there's no kind of roadmap for the future. Now, how do we um, sort of square that up when we've actually kind of, well, not everyone voted for the change, but people voted for something that they didn't exactly know what the type of change they were going to get. And the system complexity of actually, um, the, the, the future roadmap of that change is incredibly complex, but the kind of narrative was quite simple to actually achieve. Um, and I, on the Brexit topic while we're on it, Duncan, um, I, there's quite a lot of people in the NGO community who are probably pretty horrified, it's fair to say, with the result. Yeah. Um, and uh, so how can your uh, framework help them to un lessen that how can change happen in a positive way, but more in that how on earth did that happen? <laughs> and let me understand what just happened. <laughs> okay. Is your framework of any use to them in um, that cathartic exercise? Okay. All right. I'm going to the States to do uh, a tour in uh, end of November, and I'm terrified that Trump wins. I'm asked to explain how Trump won. Um, it's going to be, <laughs> I mean, there are other reasons to be terrified, but that's my particular one. Um, all right, the role of business. So, um, <clears throat> Hugh very helpfully said, talk about transnationals and talk about local, small, and, and medium enterprises. So I think 
I interviewed a couple of uh, transnational CEOs for the book. Um, one of them allowed me to use his quotes, the other didn't, um, which is a real shame because they were really juicy. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's, it's clear that you've got, yeah, uh, Nyla very helpfully made me realize what I'd written, which was great, that, that in, in, in transnationals, as with everywhere else, you have a spectrum, leaders and laggards, and the job of the activist is to ally with the leaders to put pressure on the laggards. And what's interesting with business is they start off saying, we want voluntary approaches to this, that, and the other. And then you work with the leaders on these voluntary approaches, and very quickly they're saying, those buggers, they're not spending any money, they're not doing anything, they're getting a competitive edge by doing bad stuff. We want some rules, we want some regulation. And it's been really interesting watching how things move between voluntary and regulatory, they're not polarized. Um, uh, on things like gang masters, on uh, intellectual property rights, all sorts of things, Quite interesting stuff. On um, SMEs, it's not, I, the book is primarily about political and social change. Um, so it's not saying, uh, yeah, I, I leave that to IGC, the actual, uh, how SMEs generate livelihoods and jobs which transform countries. But if you were trying to change policy of government on SMEs, then you would need the stuff in the book. So, you know, you have to draw the boundary somewhere. Um, Really interesting question, Orlando. Art. You know, as a Latin Americanist by background, I listened to so much revolutionary music, and it was always had a you know, hugely um, reassuring and galvanizing role. And um, I, I think it's a, a yet another enormous blind spot, actually, I have to say. The, you know, the aid and development business is, is kind of it's very sparse emotionally and spiritually. We don't do religion. We don't do art. We don't do love. You know, we just do numbers isn't it awful um and yet that's not the crazy thing is that's not what motivates the people who are doing this stuff on the ground so you have this yeah we may have our own forms of cognitive dissonance but the dissonance between the people who are giving up their lives to change stuff on the ground and these weird sort of desiccated discourses that come from here uh is, is vast so i think if we can bring more uh art into the you know more of anything, actually, would be, would be uh, helpful in understanding how change processes really happen and how people keep going through the bad times, which I think is particularly true of that. Um, Brexit, the ultimate, well, it's not the ultimate, but it is a pretty big critical juncture, I'd say, you know? Um, and like many critical junctures, it was unforeseen, um, like the financial crisis or the food price spike or whatever. Um, and like critical junctures, it is both a window of opportunity and a window of threat. So if you're working on Brexit at the moment, I think you have to choose whether it's primarily an opportunity or a threat. If it's an opportunity, then you need to think, where are those opportunities and how do we do it? So for example, uh, you have a Department of Trade which has no idea what it's doing. Brilliant, okay? Because <laughs> when you have a, a new institution, it's malleable, it's still sorting itself out, it's open to persuasion, it's looking for friends, it doesn't have many friends. Um, so if you want to influence the Department of Trade, the best thing to do is to form an alliance with it against Boris Johnson in the Foreign <laughs> Office or something like that. You know, play politics, find out how you can actually be a friend to this very friendless organization at a time of great malleability. So that's kind of semi-joking but semi-serious. Um, you would make a lot of friends if you said these are ten things that do not need to be changed that would have a really good effect. Because you've got a situation where the Department of Trade has a ridiculously massive task and it will be looking for some quick wins. So if you can help them find some quick wins, that would be really good too. Um, but I think it's, it's fairly limited. Two other areas that I think NGOs, yeah, that I've certainly been talking to people about. Um, one is um, stopping bad stuff happening. And I think that's one of the things that activists are actually quite good at. So you make a big, you decide what things really matter and you go for those and just try and block them. It's often easier to block stuff than to make stuff happen. And the other thing is there will be a series of, of trade negotiations, okay, uh, between Britain and big emerging economies, first of all, uh, the Chinas and Indias, and then the small ones, sort of mopping up afterwards. In those, um, we have a kind of aging community of trade lobbyists and trade campaigners from the early 2000s, the Doha round, who are now in a kind of magnificent seven ride again mode where they're going to have to dust off all their trade policy stuff which they'd forgotten and go in and one of the best things we could possibly do is forget about the British government and go and support developing country negotiators. So if we can help them with lawyers, if we can help them with policy, if we can help them with intel, 
It may not make us friends in Whitehall, but it would probably be a useful task for activists to forget about trying to get a tiny change in the British position and concentrate on helping other countries support uh, their negotiations. So that's uh, some thoughts. Oh, yeah. Any thoughts on mm. any of those topics? Um, does, um, what, so we'll just take a couple more questions. I just wanted to know, is there anyone in the room who works for a government of any variety? Anyone? So it, it's really interesting. We've hardly talked about the mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered, uh, you've, you, you had a really interesting break, well, I, what I thought was a helpful breakdown of state categories, you know, developmental, uh, patrimonial, and fragile or conflict affected, and you spoke about about, you know, different approaches to how change happens in those. So um, I, w I wonder if maybe as we wrap up, you could give a few thoughts for the change agents, because we also focus on the activist the activist mm. end of the spectrum. And I wonder if you can give a few thoughts on, uh, in all your travels and your people you've spoken to in writing this book, and, you know, in the pr lead up to the book, uh, the, the civil servants, the bureaucrats who are driving change and making interesting things happen, um, you know, how much does this framework speak to them? Um, so that's one question from me, and then I want to just give, uh, see, mm -hmm. there's a gentleman over there in the black jacket and a lady over here in a flowery shirt. Uh, this gentleman here in the, oh, this, yeah, this lady in the, in the flowery shirt, thanks. Yeah, my name is Andrea. Um, actually, I worked in regional government in Slovakia, so I think it will be maybe relevant to your question. I would like to share my experience, and maybe there will be some kind of questions within. Um, I work in regional government in my country since 2003 in regional development department, which is practically really not bureaucratic agenda at all. It's very creative, strategic, and so on. And we were mostly dealing with the European funds. And um, because they were, I would say, quite poorly managed, and there was quite widespread corruption as well, um, I couldn't actually address change in any way. I designed game theory, but this was not the only reason and it was not covering just this agenda. And I spread it through some universities and parliaments, especially British one. And I felt very uh, disappointed at least that I got absolutely no response and no interest in any kind of investigation. I think it talks a lot about the subject and maybe the other questions that 10 years past, I keep bombarding the same stuff. People even in my country knew or even later in my department knew years ago, but nobody ever wanted to address me, you know, speak to me or investigate. And I would not just kind of complain, I would specifically ad um, could find some answers or yeah bring some policies or some changes specifically. This is waste in, ma you were talking a lot about power, but it's not just power, it's a lot more, it's even money mm -hmm. that are involved, public money or practically other money, even British taxpayers' money. Yeah. So even uh, if the gentleman asks a question about Brexit, I am uh, practically blaming Britain for not being involved in, in, in a reforming European Union, whether they would choose Brexit or not, it's absolutely up to British citizens, but they, d they practically were not involved and they should have been okay. in past years. Um, this um, is not I, do, you, do you mind if we stop there? Because that's quite a big topic already. Uh, yeah, and uh, we've got um, only a few minutes left and one other question. So thank you very much. Um, so last question from the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like my question is just a couple of things. If you could shed some light on the power analysis on how some changes, um, like the example of the bed nets, where they were given away for free, but that affected people where previously they didn't really care for bed nets, but as they were being given free, that affected their livelihoods. Uh, and the other thing is, you also mentioned briefly <coughs> the role of religion and how, same thing, how in the NGOs in certain places that have not been able to help, the religious establishment stepped in with extremely negative uh, consequences. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, well. So, a final comment, yeah. Go ahead, okay. Um, 
So a lot of the book is about how activists engage with formal institutions, uh, and the primary one for me is the state. Um, my previous book was this enormous 450-page uh, subliminal rant against one of the worst campaigns I've seen in, 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 in the NGO world, which was called Make Poverty History, um, which made out that if you dealt with aid, debt, and trade, you would somehow make poverty history. And that book said, actually, that's ridiculously exaggerating the importance of the international activists and the, those international campaigns. The, the primary driver of making poverty history will always be state-citizen interaction at national level. So this book continues that process and looks a bit more at how that actually happens. And I think some of the things I've noticed in these different typologies of states, one is even in autocratic states, there is some very interesting activism and civil society organization and influencing going on. Um, in fragile states, there's some fascinating stuff often goes on at local level, and you may have to look in different parts of the state. And you need to, you need to look often at the shadow state, informal institutions. You know, I was in the Congo, Eastern Congo, and the intertwining of traditional authorities and formal state authorities, sort of raising tax and spending it together, was really, really extraordinary. So unless you, again, understand the system, and the system doesn't always look like it's supposed to in the textbooks, then you're going to be caught, caught uh, blind, blindsided by that. Um, Anti-corruption is a huge topic. Uh, uh, I think there's some really interesting work on how you tackle it uh, from the doing development differently people. I can give you the website. Uh, I don't have time to go into it, but it's about authorizing environment and then finding a way to get some quick wins and getting some momentum. But you need the authorizing environment, otherwise you're up against it. Um, and then in terms of religion as a negative, yes, religion is both a negative and a positive. It really depends. I think everybody I talk to in the aid business is quite happy to talk about religion as a negative and very reluctant to talk about religion as a positive, even though most of our activists are deeply religious. So uh, I'm just trying to get that balance a bit better at the moment. Great. Unfortunately, we have to stop it there. Um, but I just want to, first of all, thank uh, Nyla and Duncan for uh, coming and sharing your perspectives with us tonight. Um, I um, uh, very, you know, it was, it's a great privilege for me to share the, share the panel with two people that are so knowledgeable and have so much experience and are willing to ask some of the hard questions and be critical of their own industry and show that intellectual integrity, which I really appreciate. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, if you uh, want to uh, get Duncan to sign a copy of the book, that'll happen here on the stage. If you want to buy a copy of the book, it's gonna, that's gonna, uh, there are books available for sale just outside. And I'm sure some of the stewards could direct you to where that is. So um, if you could join me in thanking Duncan and Ida.